over chapter two, uh, looking at some of the management theory and the background and some of the history that goes along with management and things that are covered in the chapter. Basically, there's two primary perspectives as far as management is concerned. You have your historical perspective. We're looking at the classical, behavioral, and the quantitative viewpoints. Then you have the contemporary perspective, which is looking more at systems views and what it is that's going on with the entire system, contingency, and then also the quality management viewpoint. So let's look at first at the historical viewpoint. The classical viewpoint gets into the primary areas of scientific management and administrative management. Behavioral is looking more at the human relations movement and behavioral science. And then the quantitative is looking more at management science and operations management. And you can see some of the years that those things came about and were really key. Now, when you start thinking about scientific management, it really does start with Frederick Taylor. OK, Frederick Taylor is, the, is known as the father of scientific management. And he really did emphasize the, the scientific study of what it is that you can do to improve productivity. Now, he had his principles of scientific management where you had to look at each part of what it was that was going on. What were the movements and things like that? In other words, he really got into the idea of, of uh, time studies. Carefully select the right workers with the right abilities. And one of the things that he was pushing was pay the person, not the job, which really does make key, uh, make, make a lot of sense. Give people the training and the incentives to do things properly and then use those principles to plan the work methods. Now, some of the things that he did were really kind of interesting. Um, he was uh, a manager at a manufacturing place in uh, outside of Philadelphia. And one of the day, one day he he saw what was going on and what was being produced in the day shift and the night shift. At the end of the day shift, he walked over to a prominent place and with chalk wrote in the amount that had been produced that day. Just wrote in the number, walked away. The second shift or the night shift was coming in and they saw the number and they asked the people who were leaving, what, what's that? And they said, OK, well, that's how much we produced today. The next morning, when Taylor came in and the day shift came in, their number was crossed out and a bigger number was written in. At the end of that shift, the night shift is coming in, that number had been crossed out and a bigger number written in. It was really kind of interesting, some of the things that he did. He also found that if there was a, a concept that he called the law of, he, the law of heavy laboring. He was working with uh, a plant that where they were uh, had a bunch of people outside. They were shoveling different things. OK, they were shoveling dirt. They were shoveling coal. They were shoveling gravel. They were shoveling all kinds of different things. And what happened was every morning people would walk in. The workers would walk in with their own shovels. And so they bring in and they come in and they're assigned to shovel different stuff. Well, what he found was because of the different things that people were shoveling, they had different weights. They had, they were, some were heavy, some things uh, as far as a shovel load was concerned was heavier than others. And what he found was there was an optimal shovel load, okay, where people could work the most amount, shovel the most amount, and still get a lot of stuff done and not be as tired. And so what he did was he designed a bunch of different size shovels, set up a tool room. In the mornings when people came in, they were assigned to shovel some different stuff and they were given the shovel for that. The amount of efficiency and effectiveness went up tremendously. The cost per uh, quote unquote shovel load went down quite a bit. So what he was doing was really focusing in on more of a scientific study as far as how can we make things much more efficient. Then you had the Gilberths, Lillian and Frank Gilberth. If you've ever read the book or seen the movie, Cheaper by the Dozen, that's what that was really all about. What they were doing was they were improving efficiency and trying to find what they called the one best way as far as how to do anything. And they really made their mark looking at bricklaying because they were looking at, OK, so what are the movements in order to lay bricks to build a wall? And what they found was here are the motions that need to happen that 
required the least amount of effort, the least number of motions, the least amount of time in order to build that wall and lay those bricks. Then you have administrative management. Henri Fayot was known as the father of administrative management. And what he found was there are key functions that go along with management. And he came up with these five key functions here, planning, organizing, leading, controlling, and coordinating. Then you have Max Weber, okay? He was German, okay? It's pronounced, it looks like Weber. He was German, it's pronounced Weber, okay? He was, what he was talking about there was the idea of bureaucracy. He found that the most efficient way to put together an organization was a bureaucracy, where you have that well-defined hierarchy of authority, formal rules and procedures, and it was more of a career type of approach to things. Now, whenever we think of bureaucracy, we think of the government and, and all of the, the problems that we run into. It takes forever to get anything done. That's one of the problems that you have with bureaucracies. The whole idea behind that classical viewpoint was the idea of a rational approach, trying to make things as rational as and, and getting away from the theories and making things as rational, as scientific as they possibly could. The problem with it, too mechanistic. People are just seen as a cog in a machine, okay? They really aren't taking into account what it is that individual people need. So then you move into the behavioral viewpoint, all right? There were various phases, the early behaviorism, the human relations movement, and then behavioral science. Well, the early be uh, behaviorism, uh, one of the key people there was Mary Parker Follett where she was basically saying that organizations need to be thought of as communities, okay? We are, we, here we are, we are a company, we are a community of people. We're gonna have conflicts and they should be resolved by the managers and workers talking about the differences and working things through. I mean, really trying to think about the behaviors of people and the social aspect as far as how people work. Then you have Elton Mayo. What Mayo did was what's called the Hawthorne Studies. It was the Hawthorne plant outside of uh, Chicago where he was called in and he basically did a series of studies in three areas, in three phases. The first phase was he, they, they had a theory where if you increase the light in an area, people would be much more efficient. OK, because if you think about the early uh, manufacturing areas, everything was dark and dingy and things like that. So what they do is they set up a room uh, where they can control the lighting. And so they put a bunch of people in the room. They were doing their work and everything in this in this room. And they you know measured, OK, how much are they doing? So then what they do is they increase the light. Productivity went up. They increased the lighting again. Productivity went up again. They increased the lighting really. I mean, it was bright as could be and productivity kept going up. And they said, okay, to check this, what we have to do is start bringing the lighting down. So they reduced the lighting, productivity went up. They reduced the lighting again, productivity went up again. What they realized was it's not light. So then they set up a second thing, uh, a second phase of the Hawthorne studies where they set up a separate room and they had a bunch of women who were working in there doing a particular job. Now they did not have a supervisor. And the El Elton Mayo and his folks were expected to supervise these women. Well, what they found was these women actually became a team. They, they were a, a social group where they would help each other out if somebody was not feeling well. Uh, they started to see each other outside of work. They were able to talk while they were working. Normally, they couldn't talk. Right? While they were working, they were able to talk, they were able to take rest breaks, things like that. What they realized was if you pay attention to folks and you show that you care about them, what will happen is productivity will go up and their morale will go up and what they feel good about what it is that they're doing. So the whole idea behind the human relations movement was you improve the relations between people and management and it's going to improve things. Now the human relations movement really did come about with Abe Maslow and we'll talk more about him and Douglas McGregor when we hit uh, motivation. McGregor was really getting into the idea of theory X and theory Y. 
Okay, theory X is basically saying people don't want to work. Uh, they're lazy. You have to stand over and make them work. Theory Y is basically saying work is as natural as play. People will want to work, things like that. And so we'll see more about this when we start hitting uh, motivation. The whole idea behind behavioral science is looking at scientific research, thinking about human behavior and applying those things to uh, the workplace. Then you have the quantitative viewpoints where you're looking at management science and operation science. Basically, management science is looking at math to try to figure out what it is you're going to be doing. So, for example, uh, you have a bunch of checkout people at a Walmart. How many registers do you need to have open based on the number of people that you actually have in the store so that you can move people through as effectively as possible? Operations management is looking at how can you actually move materials and things like this more effectively and efficiently so that you can reduce the amount of inventory that you have and the amount of time that it takes to actually produce something. The contemporary perspective is what, something that's more along the lines of what's happening today as far as management is concerned. You have your systems viewpoint, your contingency viewpoint, and then the total quality management aspect. The systems viewpoint is basically looking at how things work as a system. So, for example, think about your heating and air conditioning. All right. The input is what is the actual temperature in there now? The thermostat is looking at what the temperature is. And once that temperature gets beyond a certain, um, certain guideline, then it kicks in the transformation process. So, for example, you're thinking about your heating system. Once it gets to a particular temperature as far as being too cool, the electricity kicks on, the gas kicks on, it starts heating up the air, the fans start moving, and they st it starts blowing out, starts blowing out warmed air. Well, the feedback is going to be that warmed air and the temperature that's coming back to the thermostat. Once it gets back within a particular area, then it shuts down. That's an example of a closed loop system. An open loop system is something that has the system itself, but an external type of input into it. So for example, let's say the uh, jewelry designer or the jewelry store that's, that's putting together the jewelry that's in this example. An external piece that might come into it is say, or oh, maybe there's information as far as the gold mine where they buy all of their gold has gone on strike and something's not coming into it. Uh, there's a change as far as what it is that people are actually looking for as far as their, their jewelry is concerned. In other words, you have external types of information and things coming into the system that are actually impacting it. So that's an example of an open loop system. The contingency viewpoint is basically saying, okay, Everything that we're doing is contingent upon a particular thing. So, for example, uh, one of the things that we're going to get into a little bit later on is the idea of, of management based on what that person needs at that particular point in time. Instead of trying to treat everybody exactly the same, doing everything the same, what does that person need at that point in time? Evidence-based management is basically trying to take some of the rationality back into it as far as some of the scientific method is concerned, trying to bring in uh, facts and things like that to try to predict what's actually happening with future events. So, for example, a lot of the uh, business intelligence analysis is actually a part of evidence-based management. Then you have the quality management viewpoint, looking at what is it that we can do to make sure that everything that we're producing and the things that we're doing are most efficient and most effective possible, where you're actually looking for something that's more along the lines of zero defects. How can we make it perfect? How can we reduce rework and scrap that goes along with the things that we're actually trying to produce? The whole idea behind this is continuous improvement. In other words, you're stepping back and you're saying, okay, we see what it is we're doing here. What can we do to improve this portion right here? What can we do to, re to, do to improve this portion right here? You get everybody involved. In other words, the people who are on the manufacturing line who are actually doing the work actually know more about what it is that's actually going on. Listen to and learn from the customers and then identify and find a way to eliminate some of the problems that you have. 
that also gets into the whole idea of the learning organization. In other words, you do something, you learn something new, and you pass that along to other people. Finding those things and getting that wisdom out to others is very, very important. That's the learning organization. In building a learning organization, senior management needs to commit to it, and the people need to commit to learning. Finding and generating ideas that are actually going to make a difference, and then what are you doing to generalize that? In other words, getting that out to all of the other folks. There's more and more that's being done as far as building that learning organization where at the end of a project, you do kind of a here's what happened, okay, uh, an after action review. And you find things that worked really well and you document that. And you find things that need to be fixed and you document that. You pass that along to other people in the organization. These are some of the key points from the chapter. If you have questions, please give me a shout.